Welcome back to the Move Podcast. We're going to cover the tour of Valencia. This is the first time for the Move Podcast to be covering that uh, in our, what, five, six year history. So this is new for us. And the, the lineup changes a little bit here. I'm J.B. Hager, but more importantly, joined by Johan Bernil and Spencer Martin. So this is a new lineup you're going to see for covering some of the races we haven't covered in the past. Uh, before we jump in today to today's tour of Valencia, let's check in with Lance with a message and offers from a couple of our partners. Today's show also brought to you by Athletic Greens. Look at this here, right? Got my AG1 travel pack. I, I do not leave home without it. Uh, this is something I use religiously, as does, I think, probably everybody on the show. If you want better gut health, more energy, you're not a big fan of taking pills and vitamins like yours truly, and you want just a daily supplement, this is the stuff. 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food source superfoods, probiotics, and adaptogens, all for less than three bucks a day. Um, it's a game changer. Every, everybody says it. Everybody talks about it. All the, all the smart kids. Um, right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with this convenient daily nutrition. Let's make it easy. Head on over to athleticgreens.com slash the move. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash the move. You get a free one-year supply of immune supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs. Today's show also brought to you by HVMN here. Check it out. I got my ketone IQ ketone shot. Uh, I actually just slammed this before the show. I knew I, knew I was going to need a little mental clarity before this show as I'm not uh, I'm not an expert here, so I, I just want to try and keep up. My ketone IQ is helping me to do that. G, how how is it going with you on on, on your ketone program? Oh, great! I just got a, a, a gift pack from them yesterday, in fact, and I love yeah. it. I'm yeah, my, I, I, I love these this. partners that just continue to send stuff. Yes, it's amazing. <laughs> like if you saw how much element <laughs> and ketone IQ I have in my garage, you, we'd be getting broken into. I promise you, it's amazing. <laughs> I love y'all. Um, uh, but no, for, for real. And, and honestly with ketone IQ and HVMN, probably more than any other partner, do I get questions from folks, whether it's I'm walking down the street or just texts from friends like, Hey, is this legit? And I'm like, yes, it's legit. And, and, and nobody is disappointed. This is the world's first drinkable ketone developed in 2017. Uh, check this out also can cross the blood brain barrier. So it supports brain and body sustained energy mental focus sharpness just put your flow in for a long time uh and again we talk about it a lot i mean very very common and prevalent in the in the peloton um so uh, no secret anymore head on over to hvmn.com use the promo code the move 20 move 20 that's for 20 percent off again that's hvmn.com use the promo code the move 20 Okay. Again, first time for me even watching Tour of Valencia. <laughs> I, you know, I know you guys watch everything under the sun and, and we were even commenting like how much racing was going on today. Uh, usually not as top of mind for the beginning of February for me. But, you know, as uh, as I've mentioned on the show before, as we're getting into streaming world where so many more races are covered and distributed this is this is great, especially for Americans. We get coverage we haven't had. I think Johan has always had yeah. all of this coverage. <laughs> well, and, and JB, you know, to to uh, to add on that, I mean, the Tour of Valencia. It may not be a, a race which is very well known, um, but historically, um, in the past, Tour of Valencia, although it's not like a high ranked category, it's not a World Tour race. But it's always been an important race for riders and teams. Um, the level's always re been really high. I remember personally, my first year I was on Once, uh, which was the, one of the best Spanish teams back in the days. The Tour of Valencia was a big deal. Mm -hmm. It was a huge deal. And it's kind of, you know, a prestige uh, race where, you know, teams show how good they are. And and this was no different. You know, uh, there, there was really the big teams at the start, although it was not uh, a World Tour team, but all the big teams were there with really good lineups. And I imagine some of the early season stuff, even if it's not as big of a race, it can set a tone within a team for the whole season, can it not? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And I think, you know, what we saw uh, was basically a continuation of uh, of what we've seen last year, you know, uh, um, especially, I mean, we've talked about 
this team uh, Intermarché, you know, who bit by bit is becoming one of the top teams. And in our trades and transfer show, we we talked about how they were weakened uh, transfer wise. You know, they had lost some really good riders and they didn't get really good riders in return, but they are proving us wrong. Um, they are, you know, on top of the game, they won stage one. Uh, and they are at this time, uh, you know, there's not been many, many races, but they are number one ranked team in the world, which is, you know, who would have said that? I'm, I'm going to say, not going to say, I mean, last year, two years ago, two years ago, if you would have said, well, Intermarché or whatever it was called, then one T or that's going to be the number one team in the world at some point, I would have said, you're crazy. <laughs> well, and please go back and delete your trades and transfers show from the move <laughs> because I think I said they're going to have a hard time this year because they they lost a lot of talent in the offseason and it's not seemed to affect them at all. So uh, pretty impressive what they're doing over there. Yeah, I agree. And that's good for us, the fans, if there's more depth among more teams. And I think a lot of that we've we've been talking about the last couple of years. There's so much new young talent performing well that that's where some of these surprises come from, right? Uh, let's jump right into it. And so we'll kind of go this way. Spencer, I want you to kind of break down what happened at each stage. And then, of course, Johan, what your thoughts on that? And then back to you, Spencer. I think that'll work. All right, let's jump in. Your thoughts are the breakdown of stage one, Spencer. Should we say before we start who won the overall and then work <laughs> backwards from there? So Rui Costa won the race um, pretty. It all came down to like the final 2K of the stage five today, the final stage overcame Giulio Ciccone, who was the leader going into the final stage. Um, we'll touch on this a little bit more, but to Johan's point, stacked race. And I was thinking, wow, is Ciccone really going to, he's never won a stage race in his life. Is he really going to win this thing with a stacked field? That's that's unusual. Um, and he did not because Costa robbed him of the uh, of the overall win in the final 2K. It was pretty exciting. We'll talk about it when we get to that stage. But stage one, Sprint stage, pretty tough. That's kind of been the theme of the season. A lot of these sprint stages are hard. I mean, we're like gone are the days of meandering to the finish and, <laughs> you know, sprinters popping out and working hard for 200 meters. I mean, this was a hard, hard finish. Biniam, Biniam Germay won. Um, if you remember, he was kind of the darling of last season after winning Get Mobile again and a, and a stage at the Giro, I believe. I, I think I recall that. Beating and, Mathieu van der Poel. Beating Mathieu van der Poel in a sprint in the Giro. Yes, yes, it was. And then he finished second on the opening stage. And we, you you said at the time, Vanderpool's gassed after the stage. That is crazy. He had to go that hard hard to win what should have been a layup stage win. So Germay's really good. He's probably going to be even better than he was last year. Um, he beat... Johan, who, who is this rider on Yumbo? I, I'm afraid to say his name. He's a Dutch sprinter, up yeah, and comer. Olaf, Olaf Koy. Olaf Koy. We talked about him in the in the new talent up and comer show. Um, to me, for me, he's like, you know, he's he's one of the next big sprinters. Uh last year already won 12 races in his first year professional. And uh, you know, he got beaten by by Girmay in this stage. I think, you know, there was no no discussion. Girmay was by far the strongest. Uh, but this this young rider from Jumbo Visma is is going to be around for a while when, whenever it's up, it comes up to sprints and and also you can see that his team really believes in him you know they 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 rally around him they they keep him in the front and um, and yeah I mean uh, I think Girmay re really showed that listen Girmay at that stage he, so stage one he that, he took his first victory of the year and he already had a third place and a second place. In the stages in the in Mallorca, in the races in Mallorca, the Challenge Mallorca. So he got a second place, a third place, and then his fourth race he uh, he won. So uh, he's showing straight away that you know last year was no coincidence. He was there, you know, and surprisingly strong. But as you say, uh, Spencer, I think that this guy is uh, going to confirm his level. And he's, you know, he's up there. He's respected within the peloton already. Really, really respected. And and shows that whenever it's a good stage for him, he can finish the job. Yeah, I mean, it, he's a, that's a fast rider that he beat. That's like a le legitimate pure sprinter yeah. that he beat. Yeah. And I don't know. I, I was saying maybe I saw that he said he maybe he didn't see the finish line because of the sun. He went early. It was like a 20-second sprint. And uh -huh. It really wasn't even a contest. So to win a sprint against riders that fast and sprinting yeah. for that long, 
is uh yeah confirms that he'll he'll be someone we're talking about in the spring and the summer for sure yeah and i think also you know coming back on on this team intermarche you know i mean obviously there's a lot has changed there um one of the one of the performance managers of who was at um i think it was back then it was still sunweb uh ike visbeek uh is now the the head of performance at uh Intermarché since two or three years, and it's clear it's it's clearly noticeable that his influence is really uh, bringing the results. Um, I saw uh, some little clips from a training camp, uh, and I saw one of the lead, they 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 were training the lead, a lead out for Girmay, uh, and it was I have to say I was quite impressed with the way they're working and and the way Girmay. So you know there was three two riders basically making a train super fast and then Girmay they left him and he had to go and he could still accelerate and you know being out of the saddle for a really what seemed to me a really long time so that's obviously proven that they've worked on this because we saw that in the sprint that he went really really long and uh you know nothing nothing comes by surprise they've trained on everything including these kind of long sprints, uh, which was really impressive. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned that about Sunweb. They've gotten worse since since he left, and <laughs> Intermarche has looked a whole yeah. lot better. So there's definitely something to that. I would say that's that's correlation. Mm -hmm. um, the, the performance manager leaving and going over to Intermarche. Yeah, yeah. And I think this uh, proves that Guillerme is going to be a... a a legitimate threat in all these upcoming classics and he's got them all on the schedule the yeah. big ones right yeah and 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 also i mean i repeat you know definitely and an, a team around him who has full confidence you know the, this team has grown you know it's not it's not like it's a team that just is in the pack and tries to survive and then at the end you see how many guys you have left in the final and and give it a try no no now they have a leader or sometimes several leaders and guys around them to protect them and also to take control of the race, which in the past they had never done. So, I mean, really impressive what Intermarché is doing. Are they a Belgian team, Johan? They are a Belgian team, yeah. Yeah, so it's it's like a nice talent pool they get to choose from. It's, it speaks well for the classics. They're going to have a lot of directors and riders who know what they're doing. Mm -hmm. I was And I was thinking, I mean, if if he's that fast, you know, maybe Flanders is, is a little too hard. Uh, but God, if you're that fast and you can get to the line, you can win a lot of a lot of races that way. Yeah, yeah. No, I mean, listen, last year's again, the Evelgem was impressive. You know, you had to survive all those hills, but then especially, you know, being in that little group with uh, I think it was Laporte and Jasper Steuven. You know, I mean, those guys are like two of those. Those two guys are like in in the top top five in certain. And certain world tour world tour classics. So uh I think we're gonna see more of that from Gimai. All right, moving on to stage two. Spencer, break it down. Yeah, this was the most important stage that we didn't know at the time. Uh it was an uphill, <laughs> wouldn't call it an uphill sprint. It was an uphill finish that a reduced bunch came to. Giulio Ciccone wins it from Trek. I think there was a little bit of mistake or maybe non miscommunication, non-communication from Bahrain because Mika Landa attacks you know with maybe 400 meters remaining Chacone is right on his wheel his teammate Pelo Bilbao who would have been a fantastic contender to win this overall misses that move uh Landa accidentally I hope leads out Chacone for like it's like a textbook lead out for a pretty easy stage win for Chacone I mean uh, just the rider that type of rider on a stage like that like that's his bread and butter behind him Teo Gagenhart sprints to second Kind of, I was watching it. I didn't think he would get relegated, but I thought oh, that's a little borderline. He comes over and pinches Bill Bal against the barriers, but he did get relegated. He gets second, so that would have come with a six second time bonus. Gets relegated back to ninth, which was the back of that group. Loses those time bonus seconds, which would come into play later today or earlier today, later in this race. Um, and at the time, I'm thinking, man, it's going to be hard for anyone be to beat Chicone. He looks so strong. There's not a ton, you know, there's not a lot left in terms of climbing. So I thought right here that it was kind of wrapped up. Um, one thing else to note is with like just under 2K to go, Brandon McNulty attacked. And then Thomas 
G- Gulag, Golag. Oh, he's Glo- a Glo- 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 He's a, a British writer on Yumbo, who I think Johan mentioned in the Up and Comer show. Followed him, and both of those guys looked really, really strong. You know, right there, I was impressed. Um, Carlo Oscar, Oscar, sorry, Carlos Rodriguez was dropped on Ineos, which left them maybe a little shorthanded in that sprint, um, which caused Gegenhardt to be slightly out of position, in my opinion. I thought mm-hmm. it, it rattled Gegenhardt a little bit. Yeah, I mean, and uh, I think I think on Ineos, there there must also have been some. I mean, two things. Ineos was, I think, Ineos was re- riding really strong in this race. They had a super strong team. The strongest guy, I mean, the most impressive guy on that stage was uh, was, was Jonathan Castroviejo. He was impressive. He was pulling the whole valley before the last climb, and then when he was supposed to go on the side, he kept pulling. Dropped. Uh, first of all, he dropped uh, in Laurence de Plus, who was supposed to be the the like the, the last lead up man, and he dropped Arensman, who was sitting on the wheel. Uh, and then, so basically, that that uh, that stage, I was thinking also, I was also thinking they were riding for Carlos Rodriguez, but it turned out that Theo Gegenhardt was the guy. Uh, so I think there was some kind of chaos going on there in Ineos, and uh, that also that may also have cost them the victory. But uh, but yeah, I mean uh, that 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 climb. I agree with you, Spencer. That was kind of. You know the 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 stage that set the tone, but but later on we saw that there was there was a lot more to come. You know, uh, I think Chicone won won the stage and and he took the jersey. He was also I think he he I think they had probably two abandons. Trek Trek Segafredo. So uh, in the yesterday and today, I think he was only with four teammates left. Yeah, they essentially uh, couldn't defend. I mean, they yeah. were really at the mercy of Bahrain and Bora to control yeah. the race. Yeah, yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I also thought, you know, especially with those uphill finishes, the Chicone is a smart rider. He's fast with bonifications. I think I I, th- I thought he, he had this, you know, turned out he didn't. Yeah. We'll get to that. We're, we're teasing the <laughs> stage five as we go along. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Let's go into stage three, Spencer. So stage three, this is one of the strangest dynamics I've ever seen in a professional race. So it's a breakaway. You think, well, you know, they're going to pull him, but Peloton's going to pull him back. It's a hilly stage, classic Valencia stage. It's like hilly stage, flat finish. They're going to pull him back. This is going to be a reduced sprint. Germay is going to win. But no, they, the Peloton, they had three seconds with a kilometer to go. You know, it's like 35 seconds with 10K to go. It's coming down as expected. It's a three, by the end, it's three riders left standing. That's Bob Youngles, who's strong, really strong on Bora. Uh, Simone Velasco from Astana, and then Jonas Greg God from Uno X, who's been that team's been incredible this year. And for some reason, Danish riders are just out of riding out of their minds this year. It's like everywhere you look, there's a Danish rider winning a stage or contending for a stage win. And they have three seconds with a kilometer to go and they hold off the Peloton. There was some roundabouts in the final kilometer mm-hmm. that complicated things for the chasing group. But uh, Simone Velasco wins the stage. You know, I think I also said in the trades and transfers show, it's like Astana's got no one on this team. You know, they're Mark Cavendish and and company. Like they have no one. And I think this is maybe their second win of the year already. So it was really, really impressive. Um, I, you know, if I was, if we were doing our betting show outcomes, I probably would have bet on Bob Youngles to win out of the breakaway. So I was certainly surprised Youngles got, mugged by uh, a rider from Astana, but it was super impressive. Um, yeah. And- but also, you know, uh, so the, the peloton was really reduced. There was no, I mean, Girmay was not in there. Um, Olaf Koy was not in there. Uh, so, and I think they really underestimated those three, especially, I mean, there's a group, a little group with Bob Jungels in there. If he's in, if he's in there and he's the last kilometer, you, you cannot, you cannot say, okay, we're going to catch them. No problem. I mean, a guy like that, he's, you know, he's top notch and and he keeps going, you know, uh, I think they underestimated uh, that breakaway and then also, you know, reduced a reduced group. Uh, there's not that many riders left to pull. Um, I was surprised that um, we saw so that we had those three guys uh, in, in the breakaway and then fourth and fifth was two riders from Team Movistar. Same thing happened in stage one. 
uh, bunch sprint. So first is, uh, I think there was, there were third, fourth and fifth or fourth, fifth and sixth or something, three riders together. Um, and I've read a lot of comments and criticism about, you know, uh, yeah, what is Movistar doing? You know, are they already thinking about the points? Uh, I personally cannot believe that that's their objective. You know, I just think that they have really good riders. They're on a high level from the beginning of the season. And um, if you look at stage one, for example, they're, they're three, four, and five. That's, the, that's their maximum. They couldn't have done anything better. You know, I mean, even if you have these other two riders do the lead out for, for whoever it is, if it's uh, Garcia Cortina or uh, Girmay and Olaf Koy are faster, you know? And, and here, I think it's the same thing. You know, uh, they said, a lot of people said, well, you know, why didn't they chase? They could have won the stage. But if, if it's, if it comes together to the finish for first place, that's a whole different situation. You know, you're, it's that then you have some, some guys who really go for it uh, because some riders are just completely different when it's for the first place. And if it's for fourth or fifth, it's, it's, it's a different game. Yeah. But it was remarkable to see a key point right there. Cause this looks bizarre. They get fourth and fifth, three seconds behind the breakaway. You're thinking what the heck happened here? Like, mm-hmm. how could you have screwed this up? But no, that's a really good point because Fred Wright's sixth, Ken, Ken Bauman seventh, Rui Costa's eighth. Rui Costa, by the way, it's like a murder mystery show where you don't, you're not looking at the real killer until the finale. And you're like, oh, they were lurking there the whole time. Like Costa's <laughs> not doing anything this entire race. Like, but, but, I don't but, think but, he's no, 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 front. no. Spencer, let me correct you. Okay. With all due <laughs> respect for, let, let, with all due respect for Rui Costa, I'm going to re, I'm going to correct. Costa is not doing anything during his whole career. <laughs> 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 Except only, one world title and this stage. No, 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 no. That's not. He's won. He's won some really impressive races. He won the Tour of Switzerland. He won the Tour of Romandy. I think he won the Tour of Romandy several times. Uh, he's a really, really good rider. But he's one of the smartest riders you can imagine who can be there without anybody noticing. And everybody knows Costa is sneaky, and he's no. He's he, he's there. Uh, uh, but at the end of the day, he's a killer, that guy, you know, and, and for, you know, he got into Intermarché. It's a bit strange to see that, you know, he's, he's uh, all of a sudden back on that level, but I think he's just feeding off the winning, the winning atmosphere, the winning mood of that team. Uh, but Rui Costa is one of the smartest riders you can imagine, not the most popular rider, not the most liked rider, not in the bunch and not by the fans, but he is Super, super efficient. Yeah, 36 years, 36 years of age, by the way. He was old when he won a world title like 10 years ago. (laughs) And he, uh, (laughs) that's a delicious final. If you go back and watch that world title that he won, it's as Johan saying, you can see why he might rub some people the wrong way. It was Mm -hmm. kind of a controversial finish. But Fred Wright, you know, he's fast. Like he maybe beats Alex Ambro if that's for the win. So you're right. It is hard to to criticize Movistar. It's like, oh, you just should have pulled him back. It's like, well, what if they get beaten? And, you know, so I think I think I applaud them for being on a high level from the beginning of the season, because traditionally Movistar is an old school team. They go for the big races. They kind of get slowly into the season uh, and and they've changed, you know, they've they've changed their their modus operandi and uh, they're up there from the beginning of the season. So I think instead of criticizing, we should applaud them. Do you think mathematically, let's just say they are racing for points. So if you get three, four, and five, makes that, it's like no tw- points almost, but it's 20, it's actually more. So it'd be 20. No, it'd be 18 points. It's 18 20 points. for the, it's 20 for the stage win. So if you just think about what's the probability of Alex Aaron Burrow beating Gurmai, it's pretty low or but, but, but Spencer, you know, in those stage, it, it's not in those races, you're going to get you're going to yeah. get the points you need to, to, you know, be safe. You know, when you need to win big races or I, I could understand, for example, in a world tour classic, in a one day race, that that's what they're doing. I can understand that, but that makes no sense. And, and you know what, I mean, these guys have been around for more than that team and the direction and the management, they've been around for more than 40 years, 40, not 14, four zero. 
So they know the they know the business, you know. I mean, they're not that stupid. To, to I don't think they're racing that way. I think they're just, you know, trying to make the best of it. And uh, you know, I think in those two stages that we saw, uh, that was their maximum. You know, they could not have won the stage. Yeah, and that's what Arkea did last year. They would race for to get as many people in the top ten of a of a mm. one day classic, like. I think get level game. Um, I don't have the results in front of me, but if I think you, if you go back and look, they got a significant amount of points from that. And yeah, as you're saying, the way you get points is you would send, you would send Alex Aaron Burrow to a small race and he wins that. And he's going to get mm-hmm. five times the amount of points he gets for fourth place here. Yeah. Is this point system and the relegation they've added is this is good for smaller races. Yes. It is. I mean, but, but still, JB, you know, a tour, okay, you can call the Tour of Valencia a smaller race, but I mean, to win the Tour of Valencia, I mean, you have to be very, very good. You have to be. Let, let me rephrase good. that. Are they, because of this relegation system, <laughs> are we going to see bigger talent showing up at these uh, somewhat smaller races? I think we saw a good example of that at the end of, in the second part of last season, right? Where, where you could see all of a sudden the, the teams that were in the danger zone panicking and going to races that they would never have gone to. Uh, that's what happens, right? But And I think that since it was the first time, since uh, since a very long time that people had to, had to think about points, um, I think year one and year two, nobody really cared. And, and all of a sudden year three, they said, wow, we're here in the bottom. How, how are we going to do this? You know? Um, so it may be that some teams have woken up very early <laughs> and start <laughs> and start in year one, you know? So, um, so yeah. Yeah. And they tweaked it slightly in the off season. Like you saw Arkea skip the year to tell you last year to do like Trello Bion, which is almost an amateur level race, but they've, they've slightly modified that. So you won't see teams going to so many so, small races this year you should go to grand tours, but you, yeah, JB, you're onto something that it does help get riders to smaller races. Yeah. Okay. Let's move on to the queen stage, stage four, Spencer. So stage four was what we thought was going to be the, the definitive stage of the race. It ended up being, you know, I, I thought it was, I was in a time machine. You go to the, it finished on like a mountaintop finish. These early season races, they don't go to really high mountains cause it's snowy. Um, it's like a, a milder, Spanish coastal climb, but, um, Bora was, you know, really taking control of the race. And at the time I'm thinking, wow, Chacone is going to get a free ride to win this thing. You know, his Trek team, as Johan said, is out of riders. They can't really set pace to defend, uh, time and Arnsman from Ineos is off the front solo, really putting pressure on those other teams who, who want to win. Um, like Vlas- Vlasov, Alexander Vlasov was defending champion at this race and his Bora team was under a lot of pressure to control the race. Um, but you get to the final few kilometers of the final climb and Enios has got the sky train on the front. You know, they're grinding everyone down. It's a really high pace. They have Carlos Rodriguez, you know, looking great in a Spanish national champions jersey, just popping people off the back. And then, you know, it looked easy. Like Teo Gegenhardt sprints with 150 meters to go, wins the stage. Um, I don't think Gegenhardt had won a race since the 2020 year to tell you. I mean, talk about a guy who's been quiet. Um, I kind of forgot that he was still on that team, mm-hmm. but it looks at the, at the time I'm thinking, wow, like these guys are back, like nothing can stop them. Um, they could probably take the lead from Chicone tomorrow. Uh, at the time though, you know, Thomas, so sorry, what's his name? Johan, I'm going to get this wrong. Glog, Glog. Glog is second. Um, you know, after looking strong on stage two, he gets second, which is a really impressive result. Chicone is third. He picks up some bonus seconds. And then Rui Costa in seventh doesn't lose any time, doesn't get any time, but he doesn't lose any time. You know, mm-hmm. that's kind of the theme of his race um, through the course of the week, just sitting and, right and, there. And, in and how far back was Costa on, on time at this point? You know, he had fallen a little bit behind because of he just wasn't racking up time bonuses. Let me check really quick. Yeah. He was, he was 14, it's very, 14 very important. It is, how, how much? 14, 14. Okay. That's 14. very important as we get into the next stage, but still yeah. finish your thoughts on stage four. Oh, so yeah. that would be, I was just thinking, you know, at the time you're thinking 14 seconds, that's too hard, too, too much time because there's not really a hard stage on the final day. It finishes on, you know, maybe a 20 kilometer flat run. So where are you going to get that time? It seemed too difficult. 
but but I want to uh, you know I, I was impressed with Theo Gegenhardt. Um, as you said, you know, first win since his Giro victory, uh, overall victory in in 2020. Um, I saw the interview, his interview afterwards. He was he was extremely happy. Uh, a bit disappointed also because he knew that if he wouldn't be relegated, he would be in the lead um, yesterday after that stage win. Um, but especially, you know, I think uh, what came through to me was that he had so much bad luck in the past two two years, you know, with crashes and illnesses and uh, that we often, you know, we often say, oh, you know, this guy, he won the Giro and now he's, you know, he's invisible. I mean, Theo Gegenhardt showed in this Tour of Valencia that he has big talent. Uh, and you know what? I mean, a Giro, you don't win that by coincidence. You know, no matter who is there, no matter what the competition is, if you win a three-week stage race, you're a damn, damn good bike rider. <laughs> and um, and I think Theo Gegenhardt, you know, took his chance. The, the way he won it was impressive, I think. You know, the the, the difference in power uh, when he, when he launched his attack was, was really, really impressive in my opinion. And, um, and yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I was also impressed with Chicone, the way he wrote, because he was, he looked like he was having trouble. He was in 10th, 12th position all the time. I said, oh, Chicone doesn't have it. And all of a sudden he finds his way through the wheels and still picks up a uh, three, uh, third place. So, uh, so four seconds. And keeps his leader's jersey. Uh, actually, increases increases his lead. Um, and so, at that point, I was I was thinking, okay, Chicone has this in the back, right? Uh, the last day, you defend with your team, and you kind of let the breakaway go. And um, but other teams had other ideas. And, and just to put it into context, Chicone was four seconds ahead of Gegenhart in the GC at the end of the stage. So if Gegenhart would not have been relegated on stage two, they would have been tied on time. Um, I think Chicone maybe in the count back would have been slightly ahead. I'm not quite sure though, um, mm-hmm. because if you're tied, you count back yeah. who finished top of the other rider on each stage. Um, it gets well, no, no, if he was four seconds, if he was so, four seconds down, uh, then no, because he was, if he was second Gegenhardt, he would have gotten six seconds and, and now he got zero. So Gegenhardt oh, was sorry. Yeah, yeah, you're right. two seconds. Right. Yeah, yeah. So he would have been ahead by two seconds. Yeah. Um, which yeah. is a whole different, which is a whole different game because then it's, it's Ineos in the lead with a really strong team to control. And that's a whole different, the, the whole different race. Yeah. Strongest team in the race. I thought, yeah, just pure strength. Yeah. It probably would have been easy for them to defend a two second lead. Well, I don't think well, anything is easy at this point. <laughs> <laughs> that's what that's what I was thinking. Going into stage five, this is an easy defense for Trek. What could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let's jump into stage five. I know you ha- have a lot of notes here to break down what went wrong. Uh, it, going into stage five, it did look like Ciccone had it in the bag, as, as Johan said, but that didn't happen. Yeah, and so Bora Hansgrow, the team of Lasov, defending champion, you know, who's eight seconds back at the start of the stage, and he looked good. But if you go back and rewatch this this whole race, knowing what happens, Vlasov wasn't quite, he was not in peak Vlasov form, really, at any point in this race. So, you know, it's impressive Bora did this. In retrospect, they were just setting up someone else for the win. So they blow the race up. A really, really like select elite front group goes away. It's Chicone, Teo Gegenhart, um, his teammate, Timon Arnsman, who was like a great teammate. You, you think great teammate to have up there. Um, Vlasov, Pelo Bilbao, Mark Soler, Brandon McNulty, both UAE writers. And then Rui Costa bridges up. You know, it's like one of these things I didn't notice at the time. I was like, oh, yeah, he's just, you know, he's always there. You never really think about him. It was like, oh, Rui Costa's bridging up. That's odd. <laughs> I wonder, I wonder what that's about. Um, and then you you have a few splits. You know, it's, it was a very hectic stage. It was a couple climbs, and then it's this long, flat kind of descent, and then flat section into the finish. You think it's going to be boring, but it, it really animated the race because you have these different groups that have broke up on the climbs. And there was at one point where Carlos Rodriguez from Ineos is in a group with Mikel Landa, and they're they're not far back, like maybe 15 seconds behind the front group. Rodriguez makes the decision not to work, probably thinking, well, my teammates, I have two teammates up the road. Why would I pull Mika Landa, who's an outside contender for the overall? You know, he was 
you know, maybe 15, 16 seconds back in the GC. Um, why would I bring him up? But the reason he should have done that is that Landa's, you know, Bahrain was strong this race. It seemed like they didn't know, they didn't have any plan. Like Landa thought he was racing for GC. Bill Bow thought he was racing for GC. And Fred Wright wanted to get that professional stage win. You know, the guy's, <laughs> he's like the best rider who's never won a race before. So they're chasing back in the third group in the Peloton to get Fred Wright in position to win the stage. They have Bill Bow in the front group. Landa in the second group, who's trying to get up to Bilbao in the front. Rodriguez, if he works with Landa there, he really would have put Bahrain in a tough position because what you're not going to chase down a front group with two GC riders from your own team to try to bring riders back and win the stage. It just would have made them make difficult decisions. Instead, he sits up. That group gets kind of absorbed by the Bahrain chase group that has fast riders in it, like Alex Aaron Bureau, Fred Wright. I think, oh wow, they're gonna ch- they're gonna catch this front group. We're gonna have a little reduced sprint. Chicane is gonna win the stage. Um, they go through the intermediate sprint. Bill Bow wins that. That's kind of expected. Gets three seconds. Gegenhard gets second. Chicane third. So that means at this point, Gegenhard is only one second, one second behind Chicane in the GC. So this is pretty significant because if he gets, let's say, third on the stage, that's a four second time bonus. If Chicane finishes behind him he wins the overall. So he controls his destiny. All he has to do is beat Chicone, finish, beat Chicone and finish in the top three. And he wins the overall. I don't know what happened here, but with <laughs> 2K to go, Tymon Arnsman, his own teammate, launches an attack. Um, maybe the thought is it will put, put pressure on the group behind, can set Gegenhardt up for an attack. What the what happened in reality is Rio Costa says, that looks great. I'm just going to bridge up to Arnsman. And then Costa was going so hard in the final 2K that Arnsman got dropped, could barely get back up to his wheel, was just dying. Um, he did get back up to his rear wheel, but he was so toasted, he, he couldn't beat Costa in the sprint. And that's significant because then Rui Costa gets a 10 second time bonus and he has, you know, a five or six second gap back to the group behind him, which is enough to get him the overall win. You know, it was just like a, a huge, huge mistake by Chicone and Gegenhardt. Well, I mean, um, and also, also, you know, what you have to have in mind is also that Arnsman had done the day before he had been the whole yeah. day by himself, uh, you know, uh, up till 20 kilometers to go, he was in the front. So obviously he was, he was tired and, and, you know, I repeat, you know, Rui Costa remains Rui Costa. You can never <laughs> underestimate him. He's fast, you know, he's smart. Uh, sometimes these things happen, you know, that, you have a guy in front. I mean, I don't know exactly what uh, what uh, what was the difference in in time between uh, between Gegenhart and Rui Costa. It gets a little muddled because Gegenhart crashed. There was okay, a, okay. a crash behind, but the top and even uh, Chicone was further back than I thought. Samuela Battist- Bastianelli, Bastianelli, Bati, Bati, si, Bastan, Bast- Batistella. Batistella. He win, He wins the the group behind with Mark Soler. They're seven seconds back. So yeah. if we just assume the big group would have finished seven seconds back with Chicone and Gegenhart, it you know he wins the GC by three seconds there. But sometimes, but sometimes that's the thing. You know, I mean, if if Rui Costa gets gets ahead and Aronsman is there, obviously Aronsman wouldn't work. And then you you count okay, Aronsman is going to beat Costa in the sprint because he's just on the wheel. But that those are things that you cannot foresee you know um and and you know and costa has, i mean listen costa is he he has seen it all and he knows how to win races that guy you know um if if somebody would have told me before the tour of valencia Rui costa is gonna win i would have said no come on. <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're out of your you know, mind those, those wins have to feel sweeter later in your career in general right and also i mean let, let's face it you know costa has his career in the bag, you know, he's been world champion. He's won important races. This guy races without any stress, without any pressure. He doesn't mm-hmm. need to win races. And that that's sometimes a big advantage when you have these tactical games, you know, when you, when there's tactical games, guys who are nervous or desperate make mistakes. Somebody like Costa, it doesn't really matter if he wins or not. It's not going to change anything to his life anymore. And that mm-hmm. gives you a huge advantage to make the right decisions at the right moment. And um, I mean, look, I mean, th- this uh, this Tour of Valencia, it, it was already very, very successful for him. And I'm not saying he didn't. You know, he's 36 years old. 
it, it's not like he didn't ride hard. He finished with the lead group in every stage. So that's difficult, but he really only had to do 2K worth of work to win. The, yes. I mean, he was just playing check chess while everyone else is playing checkers. But, 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 you know, we all know, we all know Spencer that, I mean, in this case, look, he won the last stage, but you know, you can easily win a stage race without winning any stage even without being top three in any stage, but by just being always there, you know, they can say, okay, you know, he's, he doesn't do any work, but he is there every time you have to push the pedals really hard to be there every time <laughs> in those, in yes, those hard yeah. uphill finishes. Right. And he did bridge up to the breakaway. And yeah, just, if you watch this race, it's like, you really couldn't help but notice just how much work these teams are doing. Like UAE, Bora, Bahrain, it's just, just, massive amounts of work and then you think well what did Inter intermarche do you know they were just lurking the whole time you know it's it almost looked like costa was having fun in the final 5k there because no one was paying attention to him i i frankly wasn't paying attention to him watching it i had forgotten he was in that group and he just used that invisibility to his advantage yeah well, it looks like he has found uh another few years extension to his career by you know, getting out of the domestique role at UAE and getting into this team, getting his own opportunities. And I mean, listen, at 36 years old, you know, he's proving also that we we're always talking about the young talent, the new talent, you know, the, the really young guys. These guys are showing that this is not the, not the standard, you know, I mean, these guys are still up there. They're very good bike riders. I mean, Rick Costa, after having raced such a long time on all these big teams, having raced for himself, having done the job for Pugacar in UAE, he has this base condition that is always there. And that's now that he has no stress, you know, no obligation to win and can go for his own goals. Uh, it, 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 you know, it pays off. And it shows you the level of these domestiques. I mean, he's been doing pretty, I would say like not sexy GC or uh, yeah, GC domestique work at UAE for years. And, Credit to him. He went over that team. I think it was Lamprey originally in 2014 to be the leader. And then the team kind of shifts and builds around Pogacar and he didn't really complain. He just was doing a lot of domestique work. I thought, oh, wow, he's in this non-winning phase of his career. But it shows you the level you have to be at to do significant work on these teams that yeah, he can then absolutely. step out and last away from a really, really elite group to win a, a stage race. Before we move on to a couple extras that that you guys want to talk about that were happening happening away from Tour of Valencia, uh, since we do have a large American audience, Brandon McNulty looked very very good. If you want to elaborate on that, yeah, I, I get I have a newsletter beyond the Peloton, and I I never mention Americans probably because I'm trying to overcompensate <laughs> since I'm American. Um, and everyone was reaching out to me this week saying how well Americans are doing, and I'm not talking about it. So, but th so this is this is your moment, uh, young Americans. But Brandon McNulty, I thought really impressive all week. I mean, he bridged up to that front group, gets seventh on the stage, um, was off the front on stage two, just looked really, really strong. And then yeah. the ultimate American performance of the day, Nielsen Palace over at Etoile, Etoile de Bessege. Um, it's also it's like two names, Tour de Garde. They need to they need to work on some of these names as these early <laughs> season races. It's get some marketing. It's Etoile de Bessege. It's been Etoile de Bessege forever. I mean, everybody knows Etoile de Bessege. It's you know, it's the first uh it's the first stage race basically of, of any significance uh in, in Europe, in France. Um so yeah, it's Etoile de Bessege. Uh Tour de Garde. I don't know where that comes from. Um yeah. that's new to me also. And it kind of had a renaissance during COVID because the overseas races weren't happening. Um, and you've, you've had some really good GC battles over the last few years, and this was no different. Um, Nielsen Palace finished second yesterday on like the summit finish behind Matthias Skelmoj. Skelmoj? Skelmoj. Skelmoj. Danish rider on trek. Um, mm -hmm. He goes into the final TT as the race leader. Palace, Palace I, I didn't really see him that much on the coverage. It's like they didn't have a camera on him. Let's not let's not forget to mention Spencer that um, there was uh, there was a race there was a race before it was the Bessege. Uh, oh, GP La Marseillaise, La Marseillaise, La Marseillaise, which Nelson Paulus won 
solo, I believe. Uh, really impressive ride. Uh, and he was already second, I think, in one of the stages in Mallorca also. Hmm. Um, so he's definitely on great form in the in the beginning of the season. Yeah, my, my thought when I watched him win that race was, wow, he's just really fit right now. Like, I've, I don't think I've ever seen him riding this strong. And then he he torches the TT today and finishes, wins the GC by one second. Mm -hmm. I don't think I've ever seen a... a uh, Etoile de Bessege won by uh, a gap that small. And it might've even been a fraction of a second that they rounded out to a full second, but it was a really impressive ride. And as Johan says, caps off an amazing spring that he's having. So Nielsen Palace is, is definitely, you know, he won San Sebastian. I think that was 2021. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, that's a big race. So you're not really surprised that he he's good, but just to keep piling results on like this shows that he, might be, and he almost had the yellow jersey in the tour last year. There was like a mm -hmm. stage where he could have gotten that after the cobblestones, the cobblestone stage. Yes, yeah, yeah. And I think you know, being on EF, I, I think is maybe more about marketing than actual racing. But so, so sometimes I wonder, like, oh, is is he really going to develop his career there? But clearly, it's working well for him. I mean, he's, he he's, he's really. He stepped up. He stepped up, and and you know, I think he got he got the confidence. We always knew. You know, from the beginning, I remember Nielsen Paulus showing his class in, in the Tour of California when he was still on, on Axel Merck's team. Um, I, I saw this guy said, wow, you know, that's that's a really, really big talent. And then he went he went actually to Jumbo Visma uh, his first years. Uh, didn't kind of find his place there. Was it Jumbo Visma or was it still Lotto Jumbo? I don't remember. Might have been Lotto Jumbo. Yeah, he was okay. just... He was really anonymous there. He didn't do anything. Yeah, Lotto Jumbo in eight, 2018, and then it was Jumbo Visma in yeah. 19. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, he was, you know, went to a, to a really good team and, and for some reason didn't really develop there as we expected. But now, uh, now, I mean, this guy shows that, you know, after what he's shown in the tour, Winning San Sebastian also, I mean, that's it's not easy to win San Sebastian. That's a big, big race and and difficult to win. And now showing this level very regular um, the, in the first month of racing, that's, that's you know, very promising. I want to, you know, make a little, little side note that, you know, it's not because you are so good in these first races. Basically means nothing. Uh, when come April... And when and come the big races, that's like that's already a whole different thing, you know. Like now, you see, you really see the guys who have prepared extremely well. Uh, it's promising, but it's not a guarantee to have a great spring, you know. Uh, you can sometimes see guys who have who are flying in these first races, and you say, "Wow, what you know, this guy's going to be killing it in the classics," and then they all of a sudden disappear. Not saying that that's going to happen for Nails and Paulus, but you know, we must remain cautious. <laughs> I was going to ask you this question. So time and Arnsman, new team, I think getting the, everyone wants, wants to be camp champ, show up at the camp and you're the new guy on the block and you're crushing everybody. I think maybe that's why he's so fit. But so Carlos Rodriguez, not as strong as I thought he would be, but is that, that's not necessarily bad. Like, no, that's absolutely maybe even not. good that he's coming in a little slower to the season. It's at this point, at this point, Spencer, you know, it's not like he's coming to be where Carlos Rodriguez is in the final of these races, you already have to be like really good. The thing is that he just has, doesn't have that extra two or 3%, which he doesn't need right now. It yeah. means nothing for him. You know, he couldn't care less. You know, basically, I think he has done a lot, a lot, a lot of base training and, and his general fitness is really good, but he doesn't have that overdrive you know the sixth the sixth uh gear that we you know we have in a in, in a car uh it's not it's not warmed up yet but that means you know it's fine i mean if you're up there and you can do your job like carlos rodriguez did in the last kilometer basically of that stage you have to be really good because when carlos rodriguez pulled off what were they like 10 or 15 riders left yeah um so i think uh, i think carlos rodriguez Personally, he's really happy with his shape. And my next question for you, does Teo Gagenhardt's performance, I mean, he was strong. He, he might have if this race a little bit, but the takeaway should be the guy is really, really good. He's a Grand Tour winner, so we obviously knew he was good. Does this get him, I think he's just been kind of moved down the pecking order at Ineos as far as who's leading GC, who's leading Grand Tours of that team. 
Does this change the calculus at all for them, or are they just going to kind of keep going the way they are? I personally think that Theo Gegenhardt came into this race with, you know, bef- before the race, they already knew they were riding for him. Uh, you know, they have all the data, they have done tests, they know how good everybody is. Uh, initially, you know, I was thinking, you know, they're riding for Carlos Rodriguez or they're, they're riding for Arensman, but they knew they were riding for, for Theo Gegenhardt when, when Castro Vieja was pulling and then, uh, Carlos Rodriguez took over on that stage. It was clear that they knew they were going for hit for tail. And I think he deserves that, you know, uh, he's the, obviously shown in this various training camps, uh, that he's in a, on a really good level. And, and before the race, they knew that he was going to be their protected rider and leader. And it just uh, to give a shout out, another shout out to Johan, your guy, Arno Dali, who you picked in the, I think you said the last podcast we did that he was like a mix between Tom Boonen and Philippe Chalbert or Tom Boonen said that, and you reported it. I was thinking, I don't know. This guy's a good sprinter, but is he really that good? And then at Etoile de Bessege, he wins stage one and three. Stage two was called off because someone almost fell off a bridge. It was not a fantastic situation. But Delete, the thing that really impressed me is those were not like stage three. He was oh. in, a, in a break or like a front group doing a lot of work, attacking. It didn't work. And then it was like, I'll just win the sprint anyway. I mean, it was really impressive. It was. Yeah. Let me remind people, this was uh, the most featured guy on Johan's picks as up and comers to watch the 20 year old Belgian you're discussing. And what, three wins already under his belt just since you said that. Yeah. Three wins, yeah. three wins. <laughs> and and especially, uh, you know, the 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 way he won stage one in, in Etoile de Bessèche, you know, beating on an uphill finish, beating Mats Pedersen. Beating um, who was the, who was the, I mean Kosnefra. Kosnefra, you know I mean winner of of winner of a world tour race second yeah. in Flesh Wallon, and then uh, Dylan Turns was fourth winner of Flesh Wallon, uh, beating these not not beating them, annihilating him them. <laughs> it was it was unbelievable. It was like, you know, he was in the wheel of Peterson, and then when he decided to go, it was like. Just another acceleration, and everybody just had to sit down and watch him win the stage. And I've seen him win those races last year also in the same fashion. That guy has extreme power. Uh, you know, they call him the the bull. You know, he's uh, it's you know he's, if you see his his uh, victory salute, it's you know he that's his victory salute sometimes. <laughs> the bull uh, horns. He's he's I mean he's super strong. He's also a farmer. I, I, his his family owns a farm. He works on the farm sometimes, you know, deals with cows and bulls and stuff. So I think that's, you know, that's one of the reasons why they call him the bull. But that guy has, that guy has some power, man. It's, it's, it's crazy. And and to be only 20 years old and, and be able to be up there and, and do it over and over again, won 10 races last year, 10 races last year. And already, you know, uh, he already won three this year. That's, you know, I mean, of course, he he has all the power, like you mentioned. But when I look at him, he he looks like he could still lean out a lot. Yeah. You know, whether it's I mean, it's not never going to be a climber. Uh, but, you know, a guy like that. Listen, I know I've, I'm following this guy. Uh, my nephew, who's now also a professional cyclist uh, in his second year, um, I think in his. Last year of under 23, he, uh, he did a big race in Belgium and, um, he was alone. And then there was one guy who bridged up to him and, uh, beat him in the sprint. And it was 18 year old Arnaud de Lee. Hmm. <laughs> and this guy, and they said, man, this guy is something else. You know, he was on the development team of Lotto then. Uh, but since then he's shown that you know, he was right. I mean, my nephew said that, you know, I had no chance, like zero chance. The guy <laughs> came to me, pulled with me, and then just in the sprint, just destroyed him. <laughs> well, I knew he was a good sprinter, but Mads Pedersen, you know, is a world champion. And the, I, if you go back and watch the last year's stage one finish of the same race, Mads Pedersen, it's the exact same finish. Mads Pedersen wins it with a move in almost the exact same place. And it looked like delete. It looked like a junior who was cheating, like he was lying about his age to say he was <laughs> young. And like I was like, I want to see this guy's birth certificate. Like he shouldn't be racing against these these poor young kids. And but it's a world champion, you know. It it 
look like a junior race. Yeah. It was really impressive. Yeah. All well, right. Any more, other- more to come. More to come from Arnaud Dali, for sure. Yeah. Okay. On that note, we're going to wrap this up. This crew will reassemble for the UAE tour recap. Uh, Johan, we're going to see you here again today. We're going to dis- discuss Cycle Cross Worlds. With, don't, don't spoil it for anybody now in case they haven't had a chance to watch it. I know it was a, a great day for you and it was a great race too. But we'll have, the, uh, we'll have Lance and George and Johan breaking all that down. Incredible race. But uh, again, we'll be back for a tour, uh, UAE tour with you. Thank Johan Spencer. Thank you very much. Appreciate you guys. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for having me.